and a warm welcome to episode 20 of Legal Content Chat. Can you believe it? I'm your host, Becky, and I am a legal content marketer and strategist. I currently help legal tech businesses and law firms to improve their content marketing. This is usually via a combination of consultancy and deliverables. So today's event, we've got a very exciting one for you. It's called The Thrill and Danger of business from a legal entrepreneur's perspective. So it sounds very exciting. I think I might have said in my post that it sounds a bit James Bond-esque. So um, I promise that it will be very exciting. So thank you for being here today. I'd love it if you tell me that you're here. So just give me a little wave or put a comment in the box or a question, you are more than welcome and we will get to you in due course. So let's introduce today's guest. Without further ado, we have Ian Gregg. He is director of New Legal and a self-proclaimed contacts geek. I can confirm this because we had a call just before and we were running through some of my contracts. So Ian, go forth, introduce yourself. Hi there, everyone. Thanks a lot, Becky. Awesome to be here. Uh, yeah, so well, let's see if I can keep it exciting uh, as far as the thrill and gender <laughs> business yeah. goes. Um, my name is Ian Gregg. I'm the director of New Legal. And uh, my background's entrepreneurship. I'm from South Africa originally and moved to London like 15 years ago and got into the property development investment game uh, when I started off in my career in London, kind of worked my way up um, from the bottom. Well, as far as I could, uh, as far as working my way up goes. And um, yeah, just got into, you know, setting up different businesses along the way, got into the property industry initially and property marketing, business consulting in the property space, and then kind of moved out of there and tried to really find out what, what my passion was. And yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why I guess, you know, I'm here today and in the legal space is that five years ago, I realized, it took me super long to, to do it, is that um, legal services is my passion, you know, helping people. Mm -hmm. uh, contracts, I am a contract nerd. I was always the guy who sort of read the, t the terms and conditions. So after mm -hmm. all of that, um, eventually realized that I'm actually highly energized by the law and that's what brings me to to this conversation today really awesome and i can confirm that you're extremely good at what you do you are my contracts go-to guy whenever i have a little little something i need to sort out it's uh, and it's so nice to know that i am completely covered with my business in terms of legal contracts and it is such a nice feeling Fantastic. so <laughs> let's dive in should we should we get to the thrills and dangers immediately so we don't have to keep anybody waiting um can you give us some examples let's go yeah sure so i guess um you know having started off in the property industry uh it's you know rife with problems and disputes and funny business going on so i realized pretty quickly that um my life as a director and you know entrepreneur in that space would involve putting out fires so <laughs> You know, you've got everything from like damage, disputes, eviction. Um, there's a lot of fraud that goes on. There's ID theft and people getting up to all kinds of mischief. And I learned the hard way that um, dealing with that kind of stuff takes you know a lot of grit and just having to really knuckle down and get things sorted. So my life involved learning the law to make sure that I could stay on top of everything and hiring solicitors, talking to barristers and all of that. So I was quite um, immersed in the legal space, even though I never really thought of it that way. I was kind of like, I'm a property guy. You know, I'm doing property investment, helping people buy and sell properties in London. And, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that happens in that industry, uh, it, it, you know, it, it takes it takes a lot of pain to get through it. And I realized that that was one of the re reasons why I realized that the property industry wasn't right for me. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, as much as I love property, just dealing with money and, and people's livelihoods and things mixed together just was a bit weird. It kind of freaked me out. Um, but the legal stuff was interesting. So I was like, well, let me do some business consulting. And, um, you know, the thrills of business consulting are, you know, trying to help people do well. Um, but the dangers are that, you know, business is cutthroat. It can be. And, you know, over all these years, seeing the good, bad and the ugly, the ugly, does happen a lot you know a lot of people um who are building businesses will not talk about what goes wrong and you know that's one of the things people talk about failures and mistakes and all of that kind of stuff and that's great but i think there's a stigma surrounding legal stuff and unfortunately you know when when things go wrong it can cause lasting damage and trauma and things to people and they don't 
they don't want to talk about it and uh, therefore i think people can take the risks of business possibly too lightly and i think that's why people tend to get contracts and things in place after a scare or after something goes wrong but i've been in a position where i've had businesses implode you know i got ex incredibly excited about building something and it was starting to take off um this was a, a venture in the property industry and um, which involves some video marketing and things like that as well and we grew too quickly uh, my business partner and i great chap uh, we didn't have a shareholders agreement and we mm. both had very different plans for the business and when uh, we were presented with challenges you know and we didn't have any agreement to fall back on then things just started falling apart and you know we've had to part ways and that's one of the things you know like it's exciting to be in business and things can go incredibly well and the legal side of things is sometimes painful to set up like people don't like dealing with contracts and data protection mm -hmm. intellectual property or going through shareholder stuff which is eventually you know essentially like a, a prenup of sorts um yeah. but if it's not done then that all that thrill and that exciting stuff can become uh, a problem so yeah that's kind of like a snapshot of some of that that sort of aspect of what i was up to and the thrills and dangers of that yeah absolutely i know i write articles for a business lawyer and um quite a few times we touch upon uh, shareholders agreements partnership agreements all that kind of stuff and and these things can go spectacularly wrong even if you're um you're the best of friends or family in the beginning you know things happen and you can really get yourself in a sticky situation if you're not careful totally well one of the things that pops up a lot is intellectual property and mm -hmm. people will often think of that as like their brand and their logo and tagline strap line things like that mm -hmm. um but really the at the essence of every business whether we're a legal professional or any other type of, of um, business owner um, or consultant you know the the what we create our knowledge our systems ideas strategies concepts research all of that stuff along with the brand and everything is at the you know center of the value of our business and a lot of the time people don't take the ip aspects of their contracts seriously enough in my view uh and okay. you know with the sort of proliferation of everything that you can do with automated solutions and uh, free contracts online and you know getting things done with templates and all of that that doesn't doesn't often address some of those key aspects of ip and what we bring to the table as consultants or businesses and offer our clients and that can go horribly wrong because you know sometimes for in, for instance people will use a template which involves transferring ownership of what they create for their clients to the client and then if they want to use that uh, in future uh, or they're building up a portfolio of proprietary ip documents content assets advisory notes whatever the case may be um, if that ends up getting transferred onto someone then it's lost and that can end up with with issues so the ip side of it is is a big one that we're looking at um to help people out and get that kind of stuff nailed down yeah absolutely we've had a couple of comments come in so thank you for that we've had kaylee kaylee says people hate compliance exclamation mark <laughs> that's a okay. sweeping yeah. statement but very true people do hate compliance yeah but, that's um, it i mean it's just one of those things to get out the way isn't it like you know yeah, until people have had a problem they, they won't take it as seriously as maybe they should yeah so claire has said exactly that so she said i clear up so many issues um claire's an employment lawyer um so thanks claire where people have haven't done the boring legal stuff up front and prevention is better than cure that's it <clears throat> i think protecting your ip isn't on the radar to be honest kaylee says so yeah you just said you think people don't take that too seriously um perhaps give us give us some examples of of where that's kind of gone wrong in your in your experience yeah sure uh so i mean they do take it seriously but maybe they don't know the full extent of what they could be doing to protect themselves and mm -hmm. you know they may look for options in terms of the contracts but unless you know you're getting the right kind of solution with your ip and your contracts and things like that things could end up in trouble mm -hmm. it started off with me i did work for people i ran a video marketing agency in london and i did a bunch of work i've shot a bunch of raw footage for them supplied it to them um well supplied the end product to them they also asked for the raw stuff i just thought you know no worries my contract involved transferring ownership of the stuff to them 
Next thing I knew it, they'd started full campaigns using footage of like Kensington and Chelsea, Belgravia, you know, just some really high quality footage. I thought that an assignment clause was, okay, you can, you know, own this or you can have it to use for your own stuff. Um, but obviously mm -hmm. I'm going to carry on using that for my own clients. And next thing you know, next thing I knew there was a problem. And one of the other examples is it was actually a mistake um, that someone made. So um, someone I know, they used, um, they, they set up a, a tech business and that involved collecting a lot of data from different clients and the internet and compiling it and making it useful for, um, for their business and insights for their clients. And when a big corporate used a contract for the engagement with this client um, of mine, you know, uh, someone I knew. And then the, it, it was as if there was a, some kind of mistake because what the contract said is that our client transferred all of the IP and the data and the customer lists and everything onto that big corporate. So it was almost like they used a supply of services agreement instead of another yeah. type of agreement. I don't know how it happened. Give them the benefit benefits of the doubt. They didn't intend to do that because it would be malicious. But it, the effect of that was that ev everything that was valuable to my client got transferred across to this big corporate oh. and doesn't leave the business with much value, really. Yes. Yeah, I see. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So many, many dangers there. So so how do you think a, a legal entrepreneur's perspective differs to a solicitor? And why do you think that's particularly relevant to, to founders? So this is this is a big, a big one, really. I mean, it, yeah. it sort of goes back to, you know, like reimagining what your future looks like. And things are changing so much now with the advent of tech. You know, if we're not advancing, we're getting left behind. Uh, you know, there's so much change and and realistically, with all of that, the future is not going to look anywhere near what it looks like today. You know, five, ten years ago, we were talking about different sort of stuff, whereas now people thinking about retiring or keeping their business going for the next five, ten years or whatever, that's it needs to happen in a different way. And unless we really stop and think about like what what our place is going to be in the future, um, we may be facing a dead end. And not to sound like dramatic about it, but that's one of the the real aspects of um, looking at what the future holds and coming up with a solution so that we can actually survive and thrive. So that's one of the the, the key things. Uh, with that, I mean, as far as generally speaking in the legal space, you know, uh, lawyers are incredibly smart and they're incredibly busy because, you know, clients need them and they get caught up in what they're doing and the work, but I don't know how often and based on conversations I've had, they don't get to stop and take a step back and go, mm -hmm. what are we going to be doing? You know, this is the future is different. Our business is going, going to need to make some serious changes. You know, we may need to um, simplify things. We may need to completely upskill our team. Like what is it that's going to happen? And unless, we, we do stop and, and look at what needs to happen. And we do all face a serious risk at this point um, of things going quite wrong. So my perspective, that's the general one. But in terms of uh, the, the legal space, you know, my conversations with, uh, with, with lawyers often involve them saying, I don't think that's going to be possible. So if I have a big idea or I come to them with a client who has an idea, I say, can we work on this? it's often a, a no because it's too risky or it's a no because it's too complicated. But mm -hmm. often there is all, there's a way. So there's, there's often a way to, to do things. And I think, you know, what's interesting to me is that the, the level of um, experience that professionals have will determine what they can help you achieve. So billionaires can avoid tax in really strict environments and strict regulations because they hire the best. Um, you can operate in a, a really complicated and complex environment because you can hire a barrister to clarify certain things. So what I'm finding is that um, with in, in the legal space, with the different options of business structures and, and ways of working and not falling foul of SRA um, parameters and things like that, there are always ways to find, um, not, I don't want to say a way around it, but loopholes exist. Uh, laws change, things change. The Legal Services Act came out in 2007. That was a big change. Not all solicitors I speak to even know what the implications of those are. So 
thinking about what the future holds and how our businesses in the legal space or outside of it um, are going to fit into the, the modern framework of what, what clients need and things like that is an exciting thing for me. And uh, I think that takes taking a step outside of the box that we're in and really opening up our minds to what truly could be and what we actually need to do it. So that's kind of my sort of entrepreneurial perspective. It's always being told, no, you can't do that. But yes, you can mm -hmm. if you find the right way to do mm -hmm. it. Okay, that is very cool. And it's, um, yeah, it is eye opening for sure. So do you think in the in the legal space, um, say, you know, you're talking about traditional firms or tra traditional legal professionals, do you think there is a lack of um, a foresight thinking about the future? Ge generalizing that is. Yeah, I, th I think people are caught up with what they're doing. And, uh, you know, as much as people think in it innovatively and want to embrace change and ride the wave of change and not get left behind, you know, we have pressures of life, family, money, uh, and where wherever we, we sit as a director, partner, or, you know, employee, it's it's hard to, to do the things that need to, to be done to actually make sure that our future is brighter and not a dead end. Um, I use that term just because of how, you know, to try and convey, as many of us will know, the seriousness of how things are actually mm -hmm. changing. It's not just a billable hour, con billable hours conversation or value pricing. It's it's a it's a mm -hmm. you know serious conversation. So I think a lot of a lot of people want to make changes um, and maybe don't know how to approach decision making and thinking outside of the box. So I mean I've had those issues. And I've had to bring on business consultants and and lawyers. I've chatted to barristers. I've, I've had to work out what what the avenues are, and that has involved a level of sacrifice because you have to stop what you're doing. You have to do the research. You have to invest in people who are way smarter than you, um, and talking to the right kind of people to to help you understand what those options are. Because otherwise, we will always be focused on how things were done and how we think they might be done, but not what the full potential of what could be done looks like yeah yeah that makes sense so what are some practical things that people could do you know right now in terms of thinking about the future and preparing uh well i mean i definitely just talking to to more people uh, i mean it's it's a case of what we do and what the future holds and and trying to find out how we fit into it so in my view, it's very much starting with where we're at, like what's going on. Um, and I mean, I use a bunch of like um, acronym framework type stuff, mm -hmm. which probably bores people to death. But um, one of them is GPS. Like you need to kind of know, like you need to know what, where you're going and where you are mm -hmm. in order to, to achieve things. So if we're talking in the legal space, because I know a number of people are here, uh, it's looking at like what are growth spaces and what areas are likely to enter into decline. Um, okay. what the gaps might look like and then as far as um, the, the P goes that's looking at what your what a product might be um, so not just services like products and solutions and trying to find out what those what the changing dynamic of the client looks like and then coming up with solutions and products that we can plug in um, to to solve those but one of the things that I've noticed with the legal space is that people aren't necessarily developing enough proprietary products. So they'll use documents, okay. you know, and routers and things like that. Um, but the the value is the IP and, and developing something that's unique and proprietary um, that can be monetized and used in the future. Uh, and yeah, I mean, not to go ramble too much about that, but there's, there's quite a lot to, <laughs> to look at in that space if anyone's interested in anything like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, drop drop in a DM if you are interested in that for sure. So, are there some like um, talk to me about the best ways that that people can do that? You know, to productize and place. Yeah, sure. So, if you're looking at systemization and productization, uh, then it's I do a five S's type thing, um, which is one is stop and really work out what's <laughs> going on. You know, um, mm -hmm. truly understand what's working in your business, what's not. Like if you're a consultant or a, a what, you know, what's most in demand and starting to detect what those patterns are and look at the data. Because if we cover, f let's say, five areas in our business, it might be that areas one and two are the hottest and the others mm -hmm. are distracting us, our bandwidth, our time, energy, the margins aren't as good. Um, you know, that's something that we maybe need to phase out if it's not really working. 
uh, mm -hmm. you know, the full service, um, I was going to use the word spiel, it's probably not the right one, but full service agencies, mm -hmm. full service firms, that can be tricky because of the all the moving parts and all of that. But within the data and within all the interactions with people on a day to day basis, um, the answer is in there. You know, we, we do regular reviews of our data and we've cut out a bunch of stuff uh, and that's really helped us uh, improve things. And we help other people. I run an accelerator um, called Ingenuity and we look at these kinds of things. Um, but yeah, that's that's one of them. And then stop and simplifying. So we all we all are guilty, I think, of overcomplicating things and maybe doing too much and taking on stuff that's like peripheral to our core competencies interests or what you know what energi energizes us and what we're best at and if we can cut that out of the picture and really simplify how things work it does free up a lot of time it improves the margin straight away uh, and then looking at like how we systemize things after that like what can we do to just make our processes and the way we interact with people as um, standardized as possible uh, to save time and things like that also to reduce risk if we're in the legal space you know as soon mm -hmm. as you're getting something that's maybe not exactly within your your or your team's competency then you're spending a lot of time trying to work things out and it's a bandwidth yes. uh, challenge and possibly a, an increased risk challenge so that's one of them and then as far as the next s goes it's skilling up like what do we need to do to improve ourselves uh, i'm kind of i hope i'm not rambling here too much becky you're fine. Okay. You're fine. Carry on. Okay. Maybe our audience will tell us if you're rambling. Yeah, if you're rambling, I can't do. even speak yet. <laughs> That's one of my weaknesses. <laughs> um, we do need to skill up. Um, that also means cutting out things that maybe require skilling up that isn't in terms it isn't hitting the gap in the growth space for the next five years. Mm -hmm. So there's no point investing in training or upskilling people in certain areas or yourself if that's not going to yield you the highest return in the future. So I studied law to upskill and I studied an MBA. They've been incredibly helpful. I could have studied coding, but that would have been a bad idea. Um, I know that some people I speak to, they're like, well, we want to train this person on this and that person on that and that person on that. Well, why not just double down on one of those areas based on the data and the opportunity and stuff, and then reimagine what the other person's roles might be to support you know that sort of high margin thing and then if you want to scale you can applying all of that if you productize and maybe focus on a couple of things um within the range of let's say pieces of advice or documents or services that that are the you know the best and really f working on those rather than working on a whole alphabet's worth of different stuff mm -hmm. that's yeah that's yeah. a snap <laughs> yeah no that's really helpful and I think you know it's, it's about being honest isn't it within your business or within your firm about what's actually working and what's not working like what's actually driving the firm what's bringing money in why are you wasting time on things that, that aren't and then based on that based on that actual evidence then moving forward with a new plan to, to, to carry on really isn't it completely and I mean one one thing I must say I don't prescribe anything and I don't you know, say I don't try and pretend that I'm some kind of guru in the space. You know, I'm a new entrant to the legal space and I don't know what's going on with people in their lives and firms and arrangements and relationships. It can be complex, especially if there's uh, partners and shareholders and, you know, like relationships can be challenging um, to navigate, to, to actually come up with something that works does involve the people aspect. So, you know, the, the thing that I bring to the table, I guess, in my way of thinking is like, how else can we do this? If you say no, let's mm -hmm. find a yes. Like, and how can we put our egos to the side, uh, which has been a challenge for me because I've been, you know, I was very stubborn and I won't say egotistical, but very stubborn. And mm -hmm. some of the mistakes I made were totally unavoid, totally avoidable had I just no. sought advice sooner essentially i see i see yeah i think i think that is true of a lot of us though and this those kind of learning curves isn't it so what about getting better results faster and and avoiding legal issues at the same time have you got any tips for, for that topic yeah so um i mean it's fml is the sort of acronym i use for that um financial <laughs> business model and legal those are like the, the things that go wrong. I mean, one thing we look at is like the money pump. Okay, so what is it that you can do in your business to 
that really moves the, the needle. You might think it's marketing, maybe it's sales training, maybe it's upskilling, uh, maybe it's cutting things out of what you do. But some examples would be, let's say, having one person who speaks regularly, does public speaking stuff and produces videos um, based on one key pain point of a client and consistently does that. That builds thought leadership, authority. It will drive the trust levels up, bring in more leads most likely and uh, can build the brand and all that kind of stuff. So it might be that you think you need to do 10 things, but maybe just having one person to speak every day about key topics in a growth space or niche that leads to, you know, cascading increase of value from clients buying services over time, then that could be one thing to do. Um, maybe it's stopping five things that yeah. Uh, waste time, money, and energy of teams, bring down morale. Uh, that can be the one thing you need to do is to actually look at what can be cut out completely. Uh, one example could be maybe you need to increase your prices by 10%. And if you do that, that could mean that you have that money to drive into something else. And then it's like, what is that one thing that you want to drive that money into that moves the needle? People will approach things in my view, and I did this lots of times, is... Um, going for the more traditional stuff. Like some, sometimes we have to do all of it, like, you know, um, content and copy, Becky, and marketing mm -hmm. strategy, all of that kind of stuff. That is fundamental. It needs to happen. Um, yeah. Obviously, getting legal advice at the right time needs to happen. But there's always going to be one or two things that you can do that really transform and accelerate progress, uh, which takes stopping, understanding what's truly going on, and and mm -hmm. knowing where you need to go and then making those decisions but how often do we do that you know yeah i know and i think that is a very good reminder for us all to just stop i said where we're at now and actually think about what we want our futures to look like so yeah good good life lessons in general as well they were in i think which is very good oh, so um <laughs> so uh, we're going to wrap up fairly soon so if anyone does have any more questions or comments or if you'd like to maybe share with us some uh, some dangers that you got yourself in then uh, we'd love to we'd love to hear it and i know ian you referenced the um your ingenuity club so can you tell us a little bit more about it please because I've, I've seen a bit on linkedin but it'd be good to hear from your words as well yeah, sure. So we, essentially, you know, there, there are a number of options of business accelerators out there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and we try to understand where the gap is. And we think that is basically solopreneurs, consultants, uh, pr some professional services uh, industries, you know, the legal space where you traditionally wouldn't go to an accelerator. Um, you might go to a mm -hmm. consultant or a coach and things like if you're not a startup bro you might not want to go to an accelerator essentially <laughs> depending on which one you're looking at if you're not techie um, or something like that so we we saw a gap to to help people in the professional space and solopreneurs who want to get the fundamentals right uh, so we're bringing in serial entrepreneurs uh, to help with that and then uh, bringing in other experts in specific areas, marketing, sales being a big one, public speaking mm -hmm. and training being other other areas. And then we'll kind of see how it naturally evolves. But, you know, we're making decent progress and starting a couple of months ago. And, yeah, it's, really, it's exciting. The legal stuff's great. You know, love the legal stuff. Mm -hmm. But this is cool because you get to be involved. You bring new pers pers perspectives together. Um, there's the brainstorming aspect. So it's more of like a fluid kind of like bringing good, um, good minds together to brainstorm challenges, come up with solutions and really just think outside the box. Yeah, that that mastermind element can be so valuable. I've, I've experienced that myself, and it, it is great. So so how can people get involved if they want to they want to jump on, on board Ingenuity? Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, always happy to have a chat, have a brainstorm. So you're welcome to reach out. Um, I'm, I know cool. I'm connected with a number of people who are, are here today already. Hi there. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, happy to <laughs> have a chat with anyone. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, in the show notes, we will link Ian's profile. So you'll be able to get hold of him and slide into his DMs if, uh, if the knee takes you. So um, before we wrap up today, I'd love to hear from you if you'd like to be in Ian's seat today not actually in his seat because he looks like he's you know 
in the universe right now. But um, but please feel free to drop me a DM. If you do want to be on the show, you've got to be in the legal industry. You've got to be interesting and I have to like you. So those three things. If none of those apply, then don't bother. So next week, we've got Kelly Simpson. She is a highly experienced legal VA. And we're going to be talking about how to actually outsource and let it go, as Elsa said, which I know can be a challenge for us business owners to learn to let go. It's a very important skill to learn, though. So yes, get registered for that one. The details will be on LinkedIn very soon. Thank you, Ian, for joining me. It was lovely to speak to you today. Always a pleasure, never a chore. Thanks, Becky. Thanks, everyone, for watching as well. Yeah, thank you. We've just had a couple of thank yous. So that is lovely. So we shall crack on with the rest of our days now, but it's been an absolute delight. So until next week, see you later. Cheers. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. I just completely vanished, but um still live it says. <laughs>